And uh, it, it really, it, we just started a relationship, uh, and it was soon after, uh, Steve Chandler, I think, was working with us at the time, traveling and, and doing sound. You know, when you have this much stuff on stage, it's hard to have a mixer on stage and make it all sound the way I want it to sound. I'm very picky. Um, so Steve wasn't able to go. I called Mark. I said, hey, I, I need you this weekend if you're available. I said, have you ever done live sound? He said, well, you know, I've, I've, I, I know about it, and I've played around with it a little bit. And then... So that weekend he went out, and he's been with us ever since. Eight years later. Eight years later. Is that eight years now? It's, it's going on eight years, and they haven't asked me to stay home yet. Feels like 18. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But Mark is, you know, I, 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 Mark, I, I continuously, you know, when you have other groups that pay attention to your detail to come up and say to you, Mark is killer. Mark does a great job. Your blends are good. You know, your, your sound is great. You know, so first of all, I'm thankful to have Mark. He, is, he has a, a, a golden ear. And, uh, I'm sorry, what? I, I do. I won't repeat it. <laughs> but Mark is an incredible engineer. Uh, so with that being said, and he does have four Grammys, lots of Dove Awards. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, any, any <laughs> well, I, I obviously have the uh, Absolutely Gospel Award, uh, which was yeah. for the Isaacs. Uh, the award I think I'm the most proud of, which I don't have in my possession, is an award called a Marlin Award, which is the Caribbean Contemporary Gospel Awards. And I did an instrumental record 10 years ago or so, a uh, piano player in the Bahamas, and uh, uh, her album won for Best Album, and also I won for Best Engineered Recording. And uh, she has yet to uh, let go of the award, although I've been to the Bahamas several times. It's never, I've never left the Bahamas with my award. <laughs> so it's one of those that, you know, it's, it's not like a Grammy. It's something completely different. It's, you know, it's a completely different genre of music. It's a different award. So that's probably the one I'm most proud of. Awesome. So let's go to the live sound. Uh, people, I, I, as I said before, I'm really picky. I have, I'm one of those guys that I started producing records because I cared so much about what instrument tones were. I, um, I, we were raised uh, in traditional bluegrass. And uh, I think the first time I really started paying attention through right before our Carry Me record, which was 91, 89, 90, 91, 92, something like that. I, I don't remember. But we were working, uh, we were working with this producer, uh, Tony Rice. And uh, Tony is my favorite acoustic guitar player, and it was a blessing to, I mean, I was raised on his, his music. And he had the, the coolest ear, and, and at, I started paying attention at that time uh, about tones, and uh, he said something that, that'll, that I'll always remember. And uh, he said to me, and this is, this is studio talk, but he said, you know, if, if, you, if you have to EQ an acoustic instrument going to tape, in other words, recording it, then you have the wrong microphone on it. That's what he said. And, I, and that just stuck with me. And I thought, you know what? I like what he's using. So I started collecting microphones. And now I probably have, just me personally, probably $150,000 just in microphones. But what it's allowed us to do in the studio side of things is it keeps all, all our tones consistent. You know, I have a, a really good set of, of mics that I use in the studio for an acoustic, and we know what works great on that. Sometimes it's a very minor change. Um, but the same thing has applied for me live. I want to be, I want to sound like a record when people hear us play. You know, on a record, you know, I'll have... Uh, Gordon Moat come in and play a piano, and, and I'll have my buddies come in and just take what we do and then just build around it so it's more musical. But live, you know, we, we don't have all that. And I, I get people coming to me all the time and say, you guys sound just like a record, and that's the biggest compliment that I can have, you know, because I care so much about what we sound like. And that comes at a price. You know, uh, the Isaacs care, care ugh, can't even talk. Um, the Isaacs carry probably about $200,000 worth of sound gear 
in every performance that you see us play in. It's expensive. But the end result is transparency. It's clean. It's clear. Uh, so I, I care a lot uh, about what we sound like, and I think that, is, that, is, that drives my passion uh, to make things sound as, as good as I can. So, I have people... Uh other, other um, acts, sound engineers come up to me and say, man, what are you, what are you doing? And uh, the sound, uh, live sound, uh, 30 years ago, it wasn't referred to as live sound or soundboard. Or, it was called sound reinforcement. And you really have to take that to heart because basically you're not creating. Like in the studio, you're trying to create something. And it's an isolated, uh, it's a controlled environment. Live sound is complete. It's the other end of the spectrum. Uh, so it, to me, it's sound reinforcement. I'm reinforcing what's on the stage. I'm not trying to hype something on stage. Uh, the way Ben refers to it, he says, I want it to sound like I'm playing for in your living room, even if it's at 100 dB. You know, I still want it to be comfortable. I don't want it to be painful. So when I come in and I see some of these other acts, and they've got top end boosted on the vocals just to make them stick out, it's like they're doing it all wrong. Um, my theory is I go in and find problems. Every room is different. Uh, when I first started with the Isaacs, the first show that I did, we played the Carson Center in Paducah, Kentucky. Beautiful theater. It's kind of similar to this, only it was very red. And uh, very red and long. And everything sounded great. And it's like, this is my first night doing live sound with the Isaacs. Wow, this sounds great. And uh, the next night, we were in the Aurora, Nebraska High School Auditorium. And it was a, a venue that was not, it was only designed for public speaking like this. It's meant for kids to come out and say, Hark, Shakespeare. And, and so it was never meant for live amplified uh, music of any sort. And it sounded horrible. And everything I could do, it, it's, uh, I refer to it, you know, I got the socks, I know I don't this yesterday, have my yin and yang socks on. To me, live sounds, you really have to to uh, accept the fact that sometimes it's going to sound great, sometimes it's going to sound horrible, despite your efforts. So even in the worst rooms that we work in, um, it's mine and Ben's, uh, our, our purpose to make it, it was more of a purpose to make it sound as natural as possible, despite our surroundings. So that's why we carry a digital console. That's why we carry our own speakers. We know what they're supposed to sound like. So we're always at the mercy of the room. So my theory is I'll go in, and uh, anybody that's been to one of our sound checks, they'll, they'll hear me going in and finding frequencies that feed back. Every room is different. They're close, but they're different. If you dip those frequencies out uh, just ever so slightly, you can crank the, the mics up louder, and they don't feed back. That's the opposite to some of the other people that try to crank the high end to get the mics to cut through because they're not going to do anything but feedback because they're putting all the top end out there and they're not getting rid of the problems, they're adding to the problems. So basically our theory is to, it's sound reinforcement. We're, re, we're reinforcing what's on the stage. That's exactly what we want it to sound like, only louder. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, when you never hear compliments Usually when the sound is good, you always hear complaints when it's bad. True? Very true. Um, and uh, my, I, I've, uh, in, 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 in every sound engineer I've talked to, it's like we always get zero credit but 100% of the blame. So, so my, uh, my theory is if anybody is looking back at me, I'm not doing my job. Well, um, we use, mom, mom said to uh, ask what, they are. Well, we wear ear monitors on stage and, and how that applies. Jerry, you need me to take that for you, buddy? <laughs> I'm sorry. Did I embarrass you? No. Yeah, you embarrassed yourself. I'm not sorry. I love Jerry. Um, we wear, uh, people ask us a lot about ear monitors and what that allows us to do. That allow, allows us to have consistency. Mark said we carry a digital console. Uh, basically, the difference between uh, a digital console and an analog console, analog consoles are the older ones, where everything um, is, you put your hands on it to change it, where the digital consoles you can recall and have multiple levels of recall per person. 
So uh, what we call ox, ox sins are each ox sin allows us to each have our own ear monitor mix. With this console that we carry right now, I can run 16 mixes of, of mixes in our ears. Or each person can have their own. And what, go ahead. I was going to just reinforce uh, what he's saying with the, between the digital and the analog consoles. Digital consoles come back exactly the same night, night to night, which makes it real easy. We just have to adjust for the room. With an analog console, you're packing it up, you, you accidentally hit a knob. You're constantly having to rebuild from scratch what you were doing, what your intentions are, and it just adds time uh, to, the, to your sound check. So it's really the digital console just helps us work faster. Uh, and more efficiently. Right. And then, so when we wear each, each of us on stage have our own ear monitor, in that ear monitor, we all have our own mix. It's like we can have our own mixing console to just hear ourselves. So, I mean, if mom is too loud, I can turn mom down. You know, if Sonia's screaming that one night, I can turn her off. <laughs> I know, I hear you. <laughs> But it's, that's why we do that, because it, it allows us, you know, it, it's basically the better that we can hear ourselves and the better that we can get consistency, the more consistent we're going to perform. You know, there's nothing worse. And those of you, I, know, I see or recognize some of you, and I know that a lot of you sing, and you go to these different buildings like we do, and you go out and you try to do the same thing consistently every night, where the room changes that every night you know if you're not in the same place it changes every night and it sometimes you know I'm a, I play bass so therefore I have to hear bass I have to feel bass um, probably more than anybody else in this room because it's 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 part of my heartbeat you know it's it's move it's what moves my fingers is my instrument and um, There'll be, there'll be nights we go into and I can just feel it and it just feels so good and then we'll go to the next night and it doesn't even sound like it's on in the house. But I know that I, I ha at that point I have to go, I trust my sound engineer. He's consistent on that side of it. But uh, I'll just add to that. Uh, on, the, <laughs> on, the, on the scale that, that we're performing on, you know, uh, I, I don't consider us in the, in the top tier of touring acts. You know, we're not playing 20,000, 50,000 people a night. You know, but there's no rhyme or reason to what we play for. We might play for 50 people. We might play for, for 8,000 people, 10,000 people. So uh, the system that we carry is we, have, we can accommodate any of those situations. When we get into bigger situations, it's, it's another story. Now, the challenge for me in the big tours, there's usually a front of house engineer. There's a monitor engineer in the back controlling just the ears. So, uh, in, the, pr in the, the principle of making everything sound as natural as possible, for those of you that know engineering, compressors and limiters are things that help control volume. They, they cut peaks down. They, they, um, they kind of harness the sound and keep it at one level. Um, in this situation, and this is a challenge for me that I've really had to learn over the, over the first few years that I was touring with the Isaacs, because I'm controlling their ear mixes too. Uh, they don't want to hear compression. They want to hear, they, they're so dynamic, you know, they want to hear the dynamics in their voice. They don't want to start singing really loud and suddenly it doesn't go any further. So, to me, there's no, we don't use any compression on the vocals at all. And as little EQ as possible, it's really just dialing out problems. So, to me, a, a lot of guys will come up to me after the show and say, man, you, you just real like you were working hard tonight. It's like, well, to me, because there's, we're not using any compression, it's a performance for me, too. Changing the blends with the compression, it automatically does that, but it doesn't necessarily sound the best. So to me, it's a performance as much as it is them a performance. So if I miss turning something up, that's missing my cue. That would be the equivalent of Ben missing a bass note or, or Sonia trying to play the solo in li uh, um, Living Years. Ten. I give her, for those of you who have heard Living Years, the, 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 there's three times it does a lick, one in a lower key, and then when it modulates up, it does it twice. She misses them a lot. Especially in the first key. I grade her every night, and if I have an assistant with me or somebody that's shadowing us on tour, I'll, I'll make them do the numbers. But usually I'll give her a... Scale of one to ten. Scale of one to ten, and sometimes she gets a one, sometimes she gets a one minus. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, I would say on the back half, the two times that it's in the upper key, you know, she gets a solid eight or nine every night. <laughs> Good for her. So anyway. What, we have fun. 
Now the point is, uh, with, with no compression in the ears, because I'm controlling their ear mixes, it's a challenge to me to have to, to do the blends and not have compressors work it for me. A lot of guys in the upper tours, uh, if we had a, uh, with bass, bass is another thing, uh, there's, there's only two or three instruments that we have a second set of channels on the console for. Now, we have a 48 input console, but that's pushing it for the limits of what we do. Now, in the case of Ben, I have two separate lines that are run completely flat, no EQ, nothing rolled off, just for his ears so that he can fill the bottom end in his ears. Occasionally, we'll get into a room where the bottom end is so swimmy that I have to filter some of it out in the house and before we started doing the second channels, you know, Ben would be up here and I would have to filter it out and he says, I don't feel any bass on stage. But in the house, it's way, it's, it's, it's where it's supposed to be. It's way more, if I was to roll the filter down, uh, it would be way more than the room could handle. And I just, and I couldn't turn it up enough. So we set up a second set of channels just so Ben could have completely flat, solid bass in his ears. So night for night, uh, sometimes I have to roll off a little more than than other nights, but we try to make it sound as big as possible, but sometimes you're at the mercy of the room. There's certain times, he's talking about compression, and, and uh, Becky and I especially can't stand it. I can't stand to be singing one minute and then just go for something, and it just feels like you're squashed. That's what a compressor does to me, is it just squashes me. It just it takes all the energy that I'm putting out and just it goes nowhere. Uh, and I think sometimes even in mixing, and, and as this applies to studio live sound, there are certain times where it's not supposed to be a perfect blend. So when you have a compressor set and you've got this blend set with compressors, and I, I, you know, I mean, I understand compression. I get it. I do enough studio to understand that if you have somebody that sings in their mic all the time and they're screaming, you've got to have some, something to control that. Um, but on the other side of that, when you also have, you know, I, I learned this, and I've, I've always paid attention. You know, I, I remember when we first started doing the Gaither tour, watching the cathedral sing, and there would there would be times when there would be, you know, you would just it would, it would it would just George Johns would do this bass thing. And I would watch the engineers duck it and try to prepare for it. And finally, George came to him and said, you know, that's supposed to be really loud. I do that on purpose because it is a special time. It's not supposed to be perfect. It's supposed to be blend out front. And there's, there's, there's times where when Becky and, and, and Sonia and myself are singing a strong blend, that it's supposed to be really strong for just a second but bring it back. Or Becky's going to jump out on a, on a sus note, and it's not going to be the perfect blend, but the note that she's, that she's doing is, to me is more important than the blend at that point, and then it comes back in. So when you try to put compression on everything, it keeps everything the same, so you lose dynamics. Right? So, exactly. Okay. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of the amateurs run into the, uh, the uh, pattern of putting compression on everything so that they don't have to work quite as hard. It's lazy now, mixed, exactly, it's lazy. Um, uh, now, uh, in the blessing here of, of seeing a lot of great pop and rock acts and, and gospel acts, you know, you'll, they'll be on stage, and if they're going to go for a note, you know, sometimes they've got the mic, mic way out here, but it still sounds like this. And they're just, they uh, have become experts at learning how to work a microphone. So when you're, when you're singing, uh, and you're singing with compression, sometimes you're singing like this the whole time, even hey, when it gets soft, it gets soft, it gets soft, but it stays the same level. And when they sing loud, they're still on the microphone. And it just gets really loud and distorted. So when you see people on stage and they go, da 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 and, and even with Ben and, and everybody, you know, they'll sing, da 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 And when they get ready to go for something, they know how to work the mic and pull it way back so it's still volume, but it's, it, you can still hear it, but they know how to work the microphones. And that's something that the professionals have learned over and over the years. Well, the best way to do that is record yourself. If you want to see what you really sound like, take a board mix, record yourself, and listen to it. It's embarrassing. Our, our board mixes are embarrassing, but thank God for reverb and the blend out here because it's, it gets tough. <laughs> uh, and then I was going to say um, uh, 
I've noticed this in a lot of churches we go to um, and we visit, and a lot of times we'll see these great big bands on churches playing, and, and, and they're doing praise and worship type stuff, and, and they go to hit these really high energy songs, and it just feels like it don't go, come off the stage. And then they'll do something real soft where it just breaks down to acoustic and it just comes out louder than the hard stuff. That is what a compressor does. If you're feeling that in your church, there's too much compression on. Because I think that you have to have dynamics. Um, all right, so I'm going to open the floor up for questions. And this can go from anything from you're not allowed to ask questions. No, no. Okay. How you build an album from the beginning up. Okay. As a producer? All right. Well, the, usually uh, mom's asking me to explain what the steps are it takes to build an album from my perspective. Typically what happens is um, of six months to a year before someone's ready to record a record, I'll get a phone call from either a label or the artist and says, hey, we want to do a record. We'd like to do this time schedule, you know, whether that be six months or whatever. I say, okay, uh, let's find songs. We start the song finding process. Sometimes they've, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed because my sisters are incredible writers and we don't have to look too far outside. But there's a, I work with a lot of artists who aren't great writers and they're always looking for songs. And therefore, I am constantly, almost daily getting uh, from publishing companies saying, hey, this is our batch of new songs. Anything you're interested in this, we can put your name on, put a hold on it. So I'm holding on to those songs, and I'll mark the ones that I really like. And when I get a call from Bill Gaither, well, he's a great songwriter, but we don't always record only his songs. Or, you know, whoever I'm working with, Jimmy Fortune or the Oak Ridge Boys or whoever, I'll say, you know, I've got a song for this, and I'll pitch it to them, and we go through this three to four month song finding process. Once we've settled on the songs, I'll say, all right, next step, I need to book musicians in to the studio. So we do that usually a day or two of tracking for 10 to 12 songs. Uh, and then and, and with that, I, I always track in Nashville uh, because I have my core people that I use and I trust and I know I I know when we start talking about a record and by the songs that we're choosing which way I want to take it whether that be more acoustic whether that be more country whether that be more Americana and I have particular people that I use you know I may not use the same guitar player uh, if we're doing a more of acoustic thing versus a country thing and then uh, on Jimmy Fortune's classics records with, that just came out a couple weeks ago, instead of having two electric players, I had two acoustic players because it's real folky. And, I, you know, it helps. And, it, and that kind of stuff makes a difference in the feel of the record. And that's where the artist, that's my job, to get the feel that they want. Uh, or the feel that I want, and it's my responsibility to go to these six or seven guys that are sitting in this room that make an incredible living by just playing music for people. Uh, but they're so consistent and so good, and they can take one song within one hour and play it six different ways, and, and it still be the same song, but are capable and, and musical enough to make that happen. Uh, I'll just throw in a little something with uh, he's talking about uh, finding the right players for the right songs and the right and, and as much as the right players for the right song is that important, so is uh, the studio. Um, there are four different four different things when you're looking at a, at doing a, a project on somebody. One is what is their budget. Two, what is what is the type of songs they're doing? Is it is it big praise and worship songs? Is it really intimate acoustic songs? So depending on whether it's they've got a little bit of money or if they've got a lot of money to spend, we can find a studio in Nashville that either is a big rock sounding studio or a really, really intimate sounding studio for either budget. So that's another step into, uh, into the recording process. Before we even go into, go into the studio, right. we have to find the right musicians for the right songs. And sometimes we'll swap, we'll do a track with this guitar player and then it's like, okay, we need somebody that does 
the ethereal sounding electric stuff, or we need somebody that does the real chicken picking stuff. So we book those, and we book the songs and the combinations of players on those specific hours of recording so that we can get the best. Um, we're not trying to put our stamp on anybody's record. We're trying to take what they do and what their vision is and just bring it forward and get them the best album that they can uh, regardless of the budget. I mean, the budgets really don't matter, except for uh, it's, a, it's a comfort factor for us. It's more of a budgets really allow you the time to be creative. You could, if I have an album that has a bigger budget, then I have more time to be creative and add more musicians, add strings, you know, that kind of stuff. That's typically where it goes into, so go ahead. Okay. Um, that was two or four. Two. No, it was four different, four different types of budgets. Oh. High, low, and then you have the two different kinds of recording rooms. So we can find whatever it takes for that. Um, and uh, we'll get into talking about yeah, that and, in a and, second. Yeah, and, you know, uh, studios, he's, he's talking about every studio that you go in, it's kind of like somebody's home. You know, you have, you can go in and see whether it's, it's vibey. You know, if something feels real country or even woody and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a bluegrass moment and it's going to look like bluegrass music should. And usually it sounds like that too. Woods carry sound. That's why studios spend so much money uh, preparing their rooms uh, yeah, and they're usually geared towards, they try to be completely transparent, but they, they aren't. Uh, they still carry vibes. Does anybody have anybody have a particular scent that they like, like a candle? Everybody have a, their favorite flavor of candle? Anybody? Raise their hands. Everybody have something that's really, really appealing to their sense of smell. When I walk into like Skag Studio, or um, uh, the Sound Shop, which was re renovated in '89. And it was, was kind of like Skaggs. It had the Mississippi wormwood on the walls. And you walk into the studio, and what I refer to is it smells like music. Because you can smell the wood. You can smell the musty the vintage microphones. You open up a box of analog tape, and it has a particular smell to it that you don't get opening up a hard drive box. So when I walk into a studio that smells like music, it, bring, it, makes, it, it makes coming to the studio that day worthwhile because I'm being fulfilled. And so when you, when you can smell music being made, you know that you're in the right place for that particular session. We're just a little weird. We're a lot weird. <laughs> We're geeks. But anyway, from that point, from after musician studio, uh, then we start the vocal process. Uh, depending on uh, what, if it's a soloist, then usually in a couple days, a couple few days, you know, I try not to work them too hard because that's what they do. And most of the time, most of the people I work still sing every weekend. So I can't take them on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and have them sing out and expect them to perform on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I typically will take, uh, I'll set parameters, you know. Um, I, and I try to do this unless it's a tracking day anyway. When we're doing vocals, I try to start by 10 in the morning. And, and I try to be done by five or six in the evening because I want to see my wife and kids as well. But they also, it also allows them plenty of time to rest to prepare for the next day. Uh, after we do vocals, uh, we go into, uh, I have to find background vocalists, and it's just like the musicians. Different songs require different sounds. You know, some things have girls that need to be singing with guys, some things it needs to be a quartet, some things it needs to be choral. And I, I, that is a process in every one of those, and it's on the producer to book all this stuff in. So I'm constantly on the phone. I'm constantly preparing for the next two to three weeks or even farther out. Uh, and then from that process, you go to mix several days. We try to mix two, start three, maybe a day. And then that is two songs a day, maybe three a day. Uh, and that is for the ones that we have the budget for. It allows us to pay attention to the details, but we have had to do whole mixes in a day or two, you know. And it's the, the amount of detail that, that you can put into it, you, but you've got to focus on what you're doing uh, is, is what it goes into. And then from that point, you go into mastering. And mastering basically takes all your song levels and makes them the same consistency so that way between songs in your car you're not turning this one up and turning this one down turning this one up so you you, you know you, what exactly that's what a good mastering lab does and then from that point it goes out of my hands I, I'm in control of it until it leaves mastering 
and then what the label or whatever decides to do with the cover and from that point is, is beyond me. So, I'll break it down a little bit further going back to doing vocals. Um, we, when we have the, the, the uh, benefit of having a little extra time in the studio, and we try to do this even if we don't have a lot of time, uh, Ben will usually get a feel for what the vocalist sounds like before we even go into the studio. So he has in his mind uh, one, two, three, four microphones that might be the right microphones for them to sing on. So when we go into the studio, we'll have six different microphones set up that we to collectively have chosen as what is going to be the best for this artist. So we'll have them go down and sing a verse and a chorus uh, of the first song that we're working on. They'll move down to the next mic, and then they'll do down to the next mic. Singing the same verse and chorus, so each performance is going to be a little different, but we can get the characteristics of the microphone. Every microphone sounds different. When you get into the vintage microphones, the tubes in them, that's the character of the microphone. So when you put a brand new tube and a vintage microphone, it sounds good. But over the course of years and years of use with that microphone, the tube burning in, it gets that vintage sound. And you get that benefit of the vintage sound, the characteristics of that sound for years. And then when the tube starts going, it starts tapering off the character of the microphone, so we we'll go to a different microphone. Replace the tube, you get a year or so of having to build it back up to that vintage level. So we find the right microphone for the right singer. And then, you know, it's, it's about the equipment. You know, you find the right preamp. Uh, I'll give you an example. When we were doing the 432 record, we had always used a uh, Ricky Skagg C12 on Sonya through Martech or something like that. And uh, for this record, we found uh, a mic called a Paluzzo 251. And uh, she had done some work on that, and she really liked the sound of it. Uh, it's a little ex less expensive mic, not much, but a little less expensive mic. But it was a sound that she felt good singing on. It made her want to perform a little better. So we went to the Martech, and the Martech sounded great. I mean, it sounded like Sonia singing great. And he says, well, wait, what if we warmed it up just a little bit? We went to a different preamp, like a Neve preamp. And suddenly, any time there was a, like a, a pr pr predominant S suddenly the preamp had taken the S's out without us having to do any EQ to it. So every microphone, every preamp sounds different. Um, ben was saying that between the two of us, we probably own, you know, two or three, way more gear than anybody should have. But uh, my theory is a lot of people record the way they color. Uh, some people like to color with a box of eight. We like to color with a box of 96. All right, so we probably are, if we have 15 minutes, so let's, let's ask, answer questions. Have, have I covered everything mechanical from the beginning? This is one of those things, you know, I love, I love talking about microphones and gear and golf and guns. And I can talk and all God. day about all of them. <laughs> and God. And God. All right, so are there any questions? Just Live or studio? Live. All right. I use Meyer. These, this, this, uh, these are uh, Meyer. Uh, these are the Milos. I use the Minas, which are a little bit smaller. I, what I've learned uh, in live performing is, and it's just like the microphones that we ch we choose the Audio Technica 5400s, and Audio Technica has been very generous to the Isaacs. I've, I've carried these same mics for 11 years, the exact same mics. They've been that consistent for us. Just like microphones, speakers, the least amount of work that you have to do to them to make them sound good, the better. You know, Meyer is probably one of the top two or three most expensive speakers. But on the back side of that, the consistency that you get every night, you know, um, we go into these, we used to go, you know, I mean, I've had everything in the past. We, we used to go into these gymnatoriums, and uh, I, I've had times when, you know, it just, it just didn't sound good. And, and, I mean, in the past, but with me carrying, and I chose the, the Meyer um, stuff because I've never been in a situation where it sounded bad. There's been places that it sounded better than others. But preference the amount of work that it takes to make them sound the way I need them to is, is way less with a, a speaker that is completely transparent. You know, Mark and I both talked about 
I, and when you hear a record that I've worked on, I, I try not to change any tones. You know, if there's points that stick out, we try to duck those. But I love to have consistency uh, and, and, and body and, and just normal. And that is, that is why we choose Meyer. Uh, and I think my sisters both can tell you, uh, and, and mom probably, because we can't always use our sound system. A lot of places we go into, they've uh, they've used something else, and you know it's we just have to tie into their stuff. And I promise you, you Becky especially, Becky's like, this isn't our stuff, is it? It's like, no, because it has a quality and a tone and a clearness that we need. Another way to look at it, uh, Meyer is expensive. It's I mean it's dreadfully expensive. But Ben has speakers that are 13 years old, 15 years old, that are, they hold their value. Yes. So the difference is, uh, and if you're starting out with live sound, you, you, you go with what you can afford. But if this is going to be a career, if it's going to be a passion, you have to make the investment. You know, and it's, it's really just a one-time investment. Because if you buy the best, the best is going to last. And the best is going to sound good. You're not going to be constantly saying, boy, I wish I had something that sounded just a little bit better. But uh, it, when you make the investment, then you have that consistent sound from night to night. Now, if you, if you can only afford a PV or a JBL, you take that and you make it sound as good as possible night to night. But if you can afford the best, and I'm not saying that Myers is the best. Uh, like I do. Well, there's, <laughs> there's you know, two or three companies that are the best, and this is the one that Ben has chosen. But if you make that investment in your career, then it'll continue to pay it back because you're getting a great sound every night and you're not having to sweat every time you, you turn them on to say, oh gosh, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't sound good as the Isaac, Isaac sounded last night. So really, uh, you, you, you get what you can afford and you make it work. Um, one second, you're not allowed to ask questions either. That's Sonia. No, go ahead. He gets mad, throws things. I throw temper tantrums. Slaps you know, them. <laughs> uh, without fail, every single night, I have two things. Somebody will come up to me, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it in a, a physical example. Here's a, here's a physical example. I'm going to sit right here for a second. Does anybody see where I'm sitting? They'll come up to me. The bass is too loud tonight. That's the sub. They're sitting right in front of the bass. And that's, that's the first thing I always ask them when they say something is too loud, whether it's the bass or the vocals. I say, where are you sitting? Yeah. And without fail, they're here. Um, I had one guy come up to me one night and says, boy, it was so loud tonight I had to turn my hearing aids down. <laughs> so uh, I get that every night. It's always too loud for at least one person in the audience. And then I usually get the... Um, the affirmation after they've left, somebody will come and say, man, it sounded great tonight. But usually the people that are complaining uh, are unaware of where they're sitting. And it could be uh, one of our tops. It could be pointed right at them. Well, and it's just overbearing for them. Another yeah. thing that we have to consider, too, is, you know, most people who come see us have seen us on Gaither videos or our videos or whatever, and they're used to hearing us through TV speakers. Okay, so they're not getting the full amount of it anyway. So you have to, you have to consider, and you know, it's hard to, you know, I, I think the Christian industry is the only industry that people could feel like they have the right to complain. Amen. You know, I mean, we go to these, we go see, especially the Southern gospel, it, they, everybody feels approachable, and, and I don't, and I'm okay with that. I, I love people or I wouldn't do what I do. But, you know, you go to a rock concert or a country concert, even a contemporary Christian concert or a bluegrass concert, nobody complains about how loud it is. If they don't like it, they shove things in their ear and whatever. But and anyway. I carry a, a, a whole bag full of uh, earplugs just in case. <laughs> and usually that's the first thing I offer them. I would pick it right in front of the soundboard because that's, that's where it's going to sound the best to me. That's, that gives you Mark's opinion of what it's supposed to sound like. Gives you my perspective. Yeah. And it, with the Meyer stuff, it's the, the best thing about, that I love about Meyer is they, they are consistent continuously. 
You know, obviously, the closer you get to them, they're going to be a little bit louder. But with the new line array type speakers, and that's the ones that do this, it allows you to do zones. Sorry, Tim, am I boring you? <laughs> anyway, so let me let them ask questions. Go ahead. Yes, always, always stereo. Because a lot of times we'll pan... If the more, if you, you know, if you have 180 degrees of music, and this is a studio question too, you can use from this side to this side, and you can have, you can adjust things from here to here. You can live as two, but what you don't want to do is have one instrument completely on that side, or this side's going to lose out on it. So you never go beyond what's audible on this side. So your window live is probably not nearly as wide. And it's real close to different. The, real, real close to uh, the studio and live are the same thing. You want vocals in the middle. You want the snare drum and the kick drum in the middle. You want the bass guitar in the middle. Everything else that tonally will get in the way. Uh, acoustic guitars, piano, piano especially because it's such a broad range of the instrument. You kind of you have to move those a little bit left and right just so that they're not clouding up the center and it creates space in the sound. Now in the studio it's completely different because you can pan stuff hard left and right and get them out of the vocals way and it just creates a sonic, sonic ear candy so to speak because you hear little things bouncing back and forth. The best way to tell that type of stuff is by headphones. So, Yes, stereo mics. Correct. Yeah. With the piano it's, it's different. It's, it's the same in live and studio. It's hard left and right. Uh, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to carry the whole instrument, but you want that separation. But piano, piano is the uh, exception where you don't really perceive left and right. It's more... It's it the sounds, way the soundboard is. The soundboard on a piano, if you hit on the high, high, side, high side, it still resonates all the way through. But if you have the, a high side mic, it's going to show up on the high side, but you're still going to hear it on the other side a little bit. Well, every, yeah, every group is, everybody's different. You know, if you're going to do a quartet type thing uh, and you've got a really good bass singer, you've got to make sure you've got a lot of good low end. If you're doing a, a high end trio and you don't really need anything that gets down there, you don't need that much low end. So it, it's every, everyone is different. Oh, Lord. Well, that's, that's you know, you, there are people that go in and, and, listen to the room. They have computer gear that will say, this is the strong frequencies in here. We need to avoid this. You know, it's just like uh, uh, anything else. You know, I mean, you can choose to drive a Porsche or you can drive a Cadillac or you can drive a Honda. Honda. You know, it's going to get you there. It, the, it's just a matter of comfort and, and detail that you want to go to. So Now, another question. We need, probably yeah. should, we're ahead. about out of time. Go ahead. So let's go. Go ahead. Just, just, just uh, doing it, you know. Uh, I started early paying attention, as I said, paying attention to what makes the tones, what mics they were using, why they chose that mic, because I liked it. It was pleasing to me, and therefore I was always trying to copy that. And, and uh, you know, as a producer, it's just my opinion. You know, uh, and it and I and I'm thankful that a lot of people trust my opinion. Uh, it has gotten me some some great work. Um, so, it's you know, there's really not any right way or wrong way as long as it sonically sounds good to you. I get the same question about songwriting. People come up to me all the time and say, you know, I've written this song. I feel like God has given it to me for you. I think the truth is. It may not be for me. God gave it to you to help you get through what you're going through for you to share it. Now, would you like to hear me sing it? Probably. But that's, that's, a, that's another thing that we get to. So anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and from the engineering standpoint, uh, there are schools. Uh, when, I, when I first started, there were like three schools. You either had to go to a four-year college. I went to a place called the Recording Workshop in Chillicothe, Ohio. It was a six-week program. They threw a lot of stuff at you. And uh, when I started, when I came back to Nashville and started in, interning, that's when you start learning. You start learning and you watch. You watch, uh, 
I was a, had the benefit of working for a lot of great engineers as an assistant, and I would take bits and pieces of what they do and make it my own, my own uh, way of doing things. So uh, the, the biggest thing, um, I, if, if I go a single week without learning something new, whether it's a mic technique or, or a keystroke in Pro Tools, then, it, then I feel like I've, I've failed myself because you never quit learning. In, in, the, in the audio industry, it doesn't matter if it was 50 years ago or right now, there's always something to, to listen to. And the other piece of advice I can give anybody that's wanting to go into sound engineering, listen to as much music as you possibly can. Learn how to record and, and to engineer the music, even if you don't like it. I get, I get worn out on classical music, I get worn out on rap music, but I listen to it, I embrace it, I don't necessarily like it, but I know how to record it. So you have to be prepared to do anything for anybody. Mark was talking about learning a new keystroke every week. Sometimes it's we relearn the ones that we <laughs> initially won because of our age. All right, next question. Go for it. Right. Well, here's what's here's as as you as you we we take so much pride and and detail in that that we either if we have the open channels create new channels and patch for them so they have their own channels so they never touch ours or bring their own sound system in and tie into our speakers. Or if, we're, if they're using our equipment, our microphones, uh, we create in, in the digital console, we can just create a new scene and change the EQs for their voice, change the reverbs, change the ears for their voice, and then we just go back to our scene, and it's exactly where we left Boom, it. Boom, where we check. left off. So. Okay. That's the benefit That's of a digital console. Right. Correct. Well, absolutely. Yep. It, it totally, that's what they're designed for. It's like you having a set of headphones on your head. It's like, honestly, I, I would compare it like being able to sing in the studio every day. Because you, it's, you have your own mixer in front of you, and that is, I'm speaking that through Mark, telling Mark what we each need. Um, as I said before, our console has 16 outputs that are designed for just ear monitors. So I can have 16 different mixes going to 16 different people. And what that means basically is I have, if I have a kick drum on channel one, all right, the fader is what goes to the house, and then there's 16 little volume knobs. So channel one all the way across on the kick drum is my ear monitor. So I can turn it up in Ben's ear only if I need more or if I need less. So what it allows you to do, you can do the same thing with your vocal or you can do the same thing with your vocal verb. See, Sonia and Becky, Becky especially likes a lot of reverb. I don't like reverb at all in my ear monitor because it's, I, I lose my sense of pitch and that's probably a bass thing. Uh, but it is, it is, a, it allows, you know, I, we still use mo floor monitors for a wash. So it is, it is a, basically a, I have one in front of Becky where Becky's just a little bit hotter and then one in front of Sonia where Sonia's a little bit hotter. And I typically, I don't use one, but I have a bass amp behind me to feel it on the floor now. Uh, so it, it just allows, you can feel, you can adjust the room on stage. When I say that, you can add a little bit more or less. But when you're wearing your ear monitors, it's, it's like wearing headphones and being able to listen to exactly what you want to mix. Yeah, the benefit of the floor monitor, because you're closed with the ear with the ear monitors, you're really closed off from everything happening in the room, and you don't even with the bass, you know, you don't necessarily feel the bass in your entire body from just the ear monitors, and that's what the bass amp, what the monitors there, so you can feel the music, so you can have a little more impact in your performance. You can actually feel what's coming out into the main uh, speakers. Sure.
a fight. Yeah, yeah. What ear monitors, right, what, what ear monitors really, really help, I think, more than anything is because the stage volume now is so low, it allows these speakers to do what they're supposed to do. So, yes, ear monitors are incredible for any type of singer who has problems hearing. So. Another benefit to having the ear monitors with acoustic music, because the state, like you said, the stage volume is low, so that we can get a little more out of the uh, instruments without them feeding back. In the old days, before ear monitors, you had to have the, monitor, the ear so loud, I mean the floor so loud, that everything would feed back. And you had to really, really find a fine line between too loud and too soft and feedback. Uh, so basically, with the lower stage volume, we're able to perform better because the instruments aren't resonating from the monitors. They're resonating from what you're playing. Yes, sir. Right. It does. No. Sound is sound. Especially with instruments, <laughs> because instruments will adapt to, yeah. what the, to the humidity. Drums yeah. will sound different humid. Bass, yeah. guitar, will sound, any instrument will sound different once it's humid, or the weather is, has an effect on it. The console has nothing to do with that. But what it is, it's easier to correct it on the digital console. You can do it you know, collectively. And then the next night, we can go back to the scene before and be back exactly where we were. Uh, we've got time for maybe one more question. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. So basically, you're keeping monitors loud, but letting the monitors feed the house. Right. Right. The only thing I would say be careful with is because what makes speakers sound good? You know, you can, it's like if, I know you guys are enough bluegrass people that if you walk up on a jam session, what's the first thing you hear? You hear the bass. You hear the bass because bass travels on the ground. Um... Every other instrument uses, it's, it's the, the size of wavelengths, and that's, that's too much detail. But what, basically what I'm, I'm telling you here is, when you're on the back side of the monitor, you have no horn. And the horn is what gives you your clarity. It's like me talking to you uh, through this and then putting my hand in front of this. You can still hear what I'm saying, but you can't make out what I'm saying as well as when you can when the high end's there. So even though the low end doesn't change, the high end changes, and it makes a big difference. So make sure that you're not losing the horn out of what you're doing, and it's all just a big, muddy mess. Make sure that, that, the, that it's got enough clarity there. So that's, that's my caution, but you, sometimes you just have to do what you got to do. You also have to have a drummer that's, that's really, really sensitive to the venue. Sometimes we'll walk into a venue that is so live that I could turn spigot off in the house, and he's still as loud as if he were in the speakers. So he has to adapt his playing style. He gets to make, really mad. Yeah, but. He has to play softer because of the room. Right, right. And, you know, it's, it just requires a, you know, there's ways, you know. I Hide mean, their sticks. Yeah. Give them Q-tips. All right, let's go one more question. Go for it. As I would say, make sure that your ceilings aren't too low. 
because, um, and if you're putting a stage on it, especially make sure that you don't block. Like a lot of times, they'll, you've, you've seen it, they'll put a stage in and then like this high right here, they'll put a, a high in so they can put doors to close it. Make sure it stays open and uh, keep the ceiling as many, because sound travels, if it hits a straight wall, it's going to bounce off. That's why all your really nice theaters, if you look in this theater right here, the only place that there are corners are in the very back. Everything else is angled. No parallel walls. No parallel walls. So that way everything that hits it moves out. So when you're, when you're doing that, side walls are okay, uh, but when it gets to the back, you know, taper around a little bit um, and, and keep your ceilings high so that way you can get enough it doesn't feel like, because it's, it's like listening to a speaker box. If it's, if it's all trapped, it's just going to be real boomy and, uh, until you can get it. It has to breathe. Sound has to breathe. It has to be able to move. Um, and make sure that you're inside of whatever type of stage that you're doing is either absorbent to stage volume. Like uh, you can, I've seen a lot of people uh, take like uh, ceiling tiles and maybe 10 feet up or 12 feet up, put ceiling tiles in them that absorbs the sound because everything that's coming off the stage is supposed to come off the stage. It's not supposed to stay trapped there. Another two things to, to consider. Uh, porous wood will absorb the sound. If you have shellacked wood or shiny wood, that's going to reflect the sound. Uh, the second thing is taking into consideration of your stage. If it's an open stage, it's not much of an issue, but if you have a closed stage like this, you need to make sure it's solid or else you, the low end will resonate and you won't be able to get anything loud because the, all the low end is resonating on the stage. So either an open stage or a solid stage. Right. It's concrete or some type of, of uh, yeah, because a lot of times it'll, it'll, sound will travel. Low end travels on the ground, so it's going to go backwards just like it goes forward. So, all right, is everybody good? Now, have I missed anything? Is there just one more question? That, no, glasses. <laughs> glasses always reflected. I mean, we actually have this saying, you can, you can tell by people, sometimes people will, you know, the thing with digital recording now is everybody can have their own unit and work at home. And, and if it's, you know, people go into these, build their studio rooms, and, and they'll try to sing this close to a glass, you can hear the reflection. So I say, I hear glass in that, because you hear the reflection. It's just not in time. It doesn't sound real dry and clean. So glass is not your best friend. Most of the time in studios you see glass. It's like this on the outside and this on the inside. And then there's usually a pane in the middle for absorbent. So. Okay. All right. Enjoy this. Let's give it up for Ben and Mark. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're going to take a lunch break. Uh, and right after lunch we have our taste of value.